The following lore is from TD Era and is an introduction to a new race on the Roleplay forums. We also now have a Patreon for those who are interested in donating. We have six different tiers with a multitude of benefits. All proceeds go to my construction crew, advertisements, and any necessities that we may need to continue on the project. For more information, check the Patreon link in the description below. These videos mention uncomfortable themes such as blood, homelessness, racism, abuse of power, branding, torture, second class treatment, war, death, assassination, shunning, public shaming, forced labor, violence, and imprisonment. Viewer discretion is advised. All remaining cities of Artruna are run by a government controlled by an elected mayor. Depending on the city, election days, location of the voting polls, voting restrictions, and length the mayor can hold the office can vary. Laws passed are typically voted on by the citizens of the city and the majority always rules. However, the mayor cannot directly release a law for voting. It must first go through the mayoral bench. This is a collection of people of respected status that will make amendments or completely veto laws that the mayor wrote. Depending on the law that is broken and depending on the city that the law is broken in, different punishments are served. Penalties can range from torture, death, and sometimes torture till death, forced labor, imprisonment, shunning, and public shaming. The amount of wealth someone has can change their punishment to one that equals a lesser crime than the one they committed. The death penalty can be given to someone even if they didn't intentionally mean to kill others. For example, if they constructed a building and that building falls on a number of people, killing them, then after an investigation, depending on who they find is responsible for the fall, i.e a person who inspected it either overlooked or purposely left critical errors or even the person that built it will be given the death penalty. It's mostly given for extreme negligence or corruption that results in many deaths. If it is a rich noble that committed a crime that resulted in any kind of death, they're mostly given a slap on the wrist. The exact opposite happens when it's someone who barely has any money to their name. In fact, if a poor man is accused of killing someone, there wouldn't even be an investigation. He'd be given the death penalty regardless of his perceived end. Innocence. Torturing until death usually results from a political or a sacrilegious crime that results in someone's death. Forced labor isn't so much a given punishment as volunteering to get out of another punishment. But the criminal must be offered this option by a judge and it depends on the crime committed. They're given a major project to work on, most likely helping the community in doing so. And once that project is done, they are free to go and their slate is wiped clean as if they never committed a crime in the first place. These projects, depending on what they are, can last from a few months to a few years. The project given is always based on the criminal's skill or stature. If they look strong, they will be given the task of transportation of materials for the construction of a building from the beginning of construction to the end of it. An elementalist specializing in the flame element will often be paired with the blacksmith to help create necessary components for projects such as building a new steam train or even to be used in creating weapons of war. Violent crimes not involving death of victims will lead to imprisonment. The judge dictates for how long they must remain behind bars. These kinds of criminals are seen as fixable. They're a threat, but can be conditioned into a better person. This usually involves training them by reading the book The Tragedy of Mordecus, teaching proper manners, anger management classes, and slowly reintroducing them back into society. Sometimes they will be given the task of shadowing someone on a job, becoming their apprentice, and then eventually getting to take on a job full time when they are released from prison. Political and sacrilegious crimes that do not result in someone's death, like spitting in a mayor's face or causing a public disturbance, will result in shunning. During a shunning, which can span anywhere between a few hours to an entire lifetime, the entirety of the city will pretend the shunned does not exist. They will not be served food or drink, they will be ignored by shopkeepers and merchants, and even their own family, should their family live in the same city, will pretend they're not there. This doesn't mean that they will be able to commit another crime without consequence. Should they attempt this during their shunning, they will face another punishment equal to the new and attempted crime. The shun is lifted when the person they offended accepts their apology. A type of well-known public shaming is being forced to carry a heavy object that they are chained to across town for an extended period of time. A stockade can also be used, and in these cases they'll be left out in the hot sun, cold snow, or even in the rain. There have been instances where a criminal is brought to a stage and citizens against throw tomatoes at them. Sometimes even stripped down to their underwear and they had to parade a sign around the city that tells people of the crime they committed. Thieves and scammers often are given this punishment along with other lesser crimes. 
crimes. A trial for the criminal is conducted in various ways depending on which city the criminal act was committed. Some judges are the sole arbiter in some cases. Other cases, there's a jury or even a court of multiple judges. The process of the trial can also vary when it comes to evidence collection and whether or not the Artroon can be represented by another. Although bribery is frowned upon, it is legally accepted and a judge, jury, and court can be bought out. The mayor, Jelena Sand, is an Artroon by the name of Bulwark Davis. He's very tall and his muscles are visible, signifying great strength. Even though he gets paid as mayor, he still dresses in raggedy clothing. He was originally from the Ronda district and was the first and only person from that low in the caste system to sign up. This is mostly because there are high amounts of political assassinations when running for mayor and the less gold someone has, the less likely they are to be able to hire a good enough bodyguard to keep them alive throughout the election. Davis, throughout the the entire election had no bodyguard and multiple attempts had been made on his life, but he survived and won the election and now resides in the Ogre district, much to the upper class's dismay. There are three sets of four doors leading in and out of the city and are used as main roads. At each of these large doors on both sides are sand guards. These individuals examine goods that come and go from the city and keep the different castes of the city separated. They are incredibly harsh when it comes to those they catch committing crimes, and they look down upon anyone who lives in either the Rano or Milan districts. The government of Jelene Sand ensures that their middle and upper class citizens are safe from criminals, but don't often care to protect those of the Rana from crime. There is a prison within the Milan district that Sand guards personally patrol, both within the grounds and outside. Visitation is time slot sensitive and monitored. It can only be done on days when there is no event, celebration, election, etc. It must be the first or last day of the week, and can only be done midday. Anyone who enters the prison, new prisoner, or visitor is frisked for any objects that may harm or aid in the escape of a prisoner. Gifts and packages for prisoners are accepted, but there is a lengthy process and multiple hoops to jump through before they can even receive them. The giver of the package has to sign a form where they have to include in very strict detail what the item is, who it's for, and specific details about it, i.e. if a part opens up and how to open it should be included. After the form is processed, the package itself will be examined by a senior SEA guard or warden. This part can take several weeks to several months depending if there's a celebration the city is running, an election event, or other type of important event that would require sand guards to protect people. And this part of the process is where the senior award and sand guard will take the object apart and examine it in full detail with magic. If the object matches the paperwork and has nothing hidden in it that wasn't mentioned in the paperwork, or any other disqualifying features, sharp objects, shovel, pickaxe, etc., then it will be given to the prisoner. Enchanted items are automatically denied entry. If it is found to have something hidden in it that was not mentioned in the paperwork, the person who filled out the form can be arrested. Those who are imprisoned, whether a troon or other race, are served gruel and water once a day. However, through hard work and good behavior, they can earn the privilege of a proper meal twice a day. They're usually prison upkeep tasks, like cleaning or helping the guards with unruly prisoners, or even helping make the girl. Snitching on other prisoners can earn you a single proper meal the day of, but most prisoners don't use this opportunity as the cons outweigh the pros. The other inmates will not trust snitches. However, if there is a rather cruel inmate that makes life a living hell for other prisoners, a snitch against them can lead to a better outcome. For inmates of the prison, regardless of race, there is a special room lit by torches that hold parchment, writing utensils, and reading material. Criminals who are being rehabilitated are allowed to use this room, as this is where classes are held. They can also write letters to anyone with any subject. However, the SEA guards will be reading the letter to ensure its contents are not a threat or hiring of a threat. Any letter, regardless of how innocent it may seem, can be discarded at the discretion of the SEA guard. If family members outside can bribe the SEA guard, the letters will be guaranteed to be sent unless it contains something threatening. Those who are caught trying to escape will result in the prisoner to be separated from their fellow inmates and moved to a smaller cell. Any privileges earned will now be lost and can not be regained until released from the cell. Their movement is heavily restricted. They can't ever leave the cell for any reason. A single meal of gruel per day and a pitcher of water they can use throughout the week will be served to them directly. They cannot leave to clean themselves or are given a cold bucket of water and a rag. 
Katrina Millers is the mayor for Kai Karag. She's very old in age, but she is strong-willed and healthy. She dresses for her part accordingly and even acts like she is in power. Her family has a monopoly over taverns across the Archon cities, some in mixed cities. If you go to a tavern in one of these places, chances are you will have heard of her. She promised to uphold the traditions of Kai Karag, but that's not why she won. She had a lot of influence and wealth to get her the win. To get into the city, the only way is through two archways and a drawbridge over a moat in between. They are both heavily guarded, and these guards remind the visitors that magic is not to be used inside the city except for in private. Any magical creatures a guest arrives with is to be dropped off at the stables just outside the first archway. It doesn't matter if it's a familiar or a mount, it needs to be left behind. Races who have the ability to transform are told not to do so in public. They need to be in their human-like form to enter. Kai Kareg guards patrol the streets to ensure no crime is committed and no magic is being used. Should they catch a criminal in the act, they will be apprehended and taken to a prison that is close to the protective walls of the city. Guards spacing the top of the wall keep watch for both outside enemies in the criminals and the prison below. These guards can be called upon by the prison warden to stop a criminal that is attempting to climb the wall. Because of the lack of magic use within the city, this usually results in death of the criminal. Criminals, depending on the crime and if they are convicted, get branded with a specific marking representing the crime they committed before being put in prison for a certain amount of time. The first branding can always be hidden by clothing, but the next three unique brandings will often be visible, back of the hands or forehead, and they commit different criminal acts. Should they commit the same act, branding of the act will expand in design. Wardens keep record of brandings and locations of the body so that, in the case of the removal of a branding by magic or other way, they will apprehend the ex-criminal and rebrand them for any and all brands that are missing. Should they be covered in enough brands, they will be exiled from the city and not let back. This is the only Archroon city with this immediate and severe consequence to breaking the law. Those who are found innocent but only after they are branded, the branding gets struck from the records and is replaced with the new branding, though painful, of the Seal of the Sun, which covers the original mark. Getting the Seal of the Sun can take months to years, and the stigma from their original branding will follow them up until they are given this new branding. This is something that is often shown off because it essentially means they have declared me innocent. You can't treat me like that anymore. It is often viewed with pity by others, but the guards will help in cases of unnecessary aggression directed at them. While a prisoner is awaiting their trial, the guards are very stern but not aggressive. This can change depending on whether or not the prisoner is convicted. Prisoners get a standard of three meals per day and a pitcher of water that all the prisoners of the cell will share throughout the week, serve to the cell. These meals are usually a biscuit or muffin with porridge. Those who aren't in isolation can go to the rec yards to socialize with other inmates. This oriental city is run by a mayor named Akihiko Oyama. He is a very tall and pale man, quite beautiful with traditional Sungei Kalopa garb. He won because he was a successful strategist in the ongoing war against the Hellraisers even leading an entire army against them at some point. He was hailed a hero upon his return, and that's when he signed up to be a candidate for the election. Despite winning the election because of his status, he is interested in making his people happy and healthy. The only way into the city is through a natural river going through the continent of Selgamet. There are guards at the gate, which lowers all the way down to the bottom of the river, who will board any boats and examine all goods that are transported in and out of the city. At the other side of the gate is a man-made river, spanning almost the entirety of the city. Even goes all the way up to and around the palace, which is where the current mayor resides. However, gates close off this portion of the city, both on land and in the water. Criminals who are caught in a wait trial are taken to Heia Saibo. It's a small prison, with maybe two guards at most. Each of the cells have a single comfortable bed and wash bin. There is also a writing desk with parchment and pen to be written with. Each of these are well lit with candle sconces just out of reach of Sydney on each wall. There is a crafted system built into the walls of the prison to put out all of these candles at once and to relight them the next morning. The meals are served three times a day and include a bowl of rice and a cup of water. Once a criminal has been convicted, they will be led through an underground pathway to an eight-story prison below the lake in the middle of their city. Once every Everyone, the prisoner and their escorts enter the prison. The pathway will be flooded by the water elementalist via a room above. This prison can be seen from outside the lake and it looks almost like an underwater palace. Inside, depending on the status of the criminal's wealth or their family's wealth, they can face terrible to luxurious conditions, but no matter their cell conditions, they will always be chained to a weight. 
How heavy this weight depends on the race it's chained to. The first floor of the prison is not only where the entrance and exit to the underground tunnel system are located, but also the rehabilitation room. This room is for those who are believed to be able to reintegrate into society. It's similar to that of the prison in Jelene San, where there is lots of reading and writing materials. Again, the guards will read over any letters written before mailing it. Unlike the sand guards, these guys will always send them unless the letters contain a threat of some sort. There is also a visitation room for those detained on the 6th and 7th floors. The second floor is where the guard's sleeping quarters are. Each room is decorated by the guard on duty to their own standards and usually includes their favorite books, photos, and images of their family, perhaps even a pet or familiar. This is also where the kitchen is located, used both personally by the guards and other workers of the prison, and used to create dishes for the prisoners. There are even several dining tables and chairs and multiple sofas to use as a break room. Despite how nice it sounds, there are actually sex of crates and barrels throughout this floor. The next floor, the third floor, is for criminals of political status. This would include military or mayoral, ex or current, or even foreigners of political status that have been convicted. These people are served three nutritious and large meals per day. The dinner having a side of sake or a dessert? Their choice. A new pitcher of water is given to them every day. Each of the rooms have a comfortable king-size bed, a wash bin, a hot bath built into the floor, a writing desk and chair, and a sofa with a coffee table. There's plenty of plant life and lighting, all within reach of the prisoner as they are the most trusted. They are allowed to have visitors whenever they want and can even decline visitation if they so choose. Visitors will get to meet them within their cells. They have full privacy. The fourth floor is known as the regal floor for children of the political that get in trouble with the law. They could be a of any age, ranging from a rambunctious kid that's hard to control to an adult who committed a crime. They have the same amenities as the political floor, but none of the lighting or plants are within reach, and they don't get a dessert or sake with their final meal. Not unless they are on their best behavior while staying at the prison. They don't get to choose whether or not they can be visited by anyone, family or other. The wealthy noble criminals with no political power stay on the fifth floor. They get treated much the same as the criminals on the regal floor, but with one exception. They don't have an option for sake or dessert, even if they've been on their best behavior. The sixth floor is for first-time or infrequent criminals that are neither wealthy nor have any political status. They have a single comfortable bed, a wash bin, and a writing desk and chair. Much like Heya Saibo, their lighting is out of reach and there's no plant life. They receive a single bowl of rice for their first two meals and have a nutritional meal for their last meal. They are also served a new pitcher of water once a week. Those who come to visit will meet them in the visitation room on the first floor. Like the last five floors, these cells are private. Private. The seventh floor is for frequent offenders that are neither wealthy nor have any political status. Each cell is shared between six people, though it's barely big enough to hold four. There are two beds hanging from chains on the walls, and the other four are made from tattered sheets located on the floor. They are served one bowl of rice and a bread roll per day, and one pitcher of water a week, and not per person. It's per cell. This often results in infighting between cellmates. The prison guards do not care enough about these people to the point where this floor is always unkempt. These cells are not private, but they still get to have visitors in the visitation room on the first floor supervised. They are the only floor that can visit the rehabilitation room on the first floor, but under serious supervision. The eighth and final floor is for those that cannot be released back to society, usually those who are a danger to themselves or to others. A lot of death row inmates are located here as well. These cells are either not private and have a single bed and wash bin, often for solitary confinement, or they are heavily padded with a metal door, which is used for those who are a danger to themselves. These people are fed a bread roll once a week and often go long periods without water because the guards have a habit of forgetting to refill their pitchers. They're not allowed visitors and they're not allowed to leave their cells under any circumstance other than to be punished by death, which is usually drowning. It is unknown whether or not the city of Zilta Abdure was run by a mayor. There is more documentation on their Muwayan neighbors than on Zilta Abdure itself. Stories pass from person to person, often resulting in information being skewed. Because of this, many Artrun and Muwayan insist that Zilta Abdure's government was ran one way and not the other, though interviews showed that the story varies. The only thing that everyone can agree on was that when the magic war began, the city became closed off to Muwayan half-breeds, regardless of relation to the citizens. One Archoon believes it was easy to enter the city, unlike the city of Magia. Instead of filling out forms, 
People were just simply interrogated regardless of their relation to anyone in the city. Once approved by the guards of the city, they'd be let in. Didn't matter if they were another race, a merchant, or someone who was visiting for vacation. Anyone would be allowed in. Exiles only happened if you broke the law there, but the guards were quite lenient. Another true believes that entry to the city varied between the guards on duty. Some days the guards would be very lax when it came to requirements to enter. Other days the guards would be super strict or even incompetent. Sometimes you had to be an Archoon to enter and nothing else. Other times you had to be a merchant or someone related to a citizen of the city. Sometimes anyone would be let in, regardless of race. When it came to law breaking, guards often looked the other way and let crime run rampant. However, and this is the one exception, if the crime was supposedly committed by a race other than pure Archoon, they'd be kicked out of the city and never allowed back. A hybrid between an Archoon and a Mayway believes that there was paperwork involved. Similar to the city of Magia, a person had to fill out forms prior to their visits and get them approved. However, as long as the approval is not revoked, in cases of criminal activity or suspicion of, they can reuse the same paperwork each time to enter the city. Only those who are Troon or have Troon running through their blood were allowed in. Our true names don't have a single origin. Whatever name a person can have in real life, they could be given regardless of whether or not another race's name comes from the same origin. Sometimes they'll name their own children after another race's more unique naming system, like the Landair or the Sydney. Some last names are shared between Artrune families, but this doesn't mean the families are related to each other. The more rich folk often have a tapestry or a painting keeping track of their family's lineage so that they would know who they're related to or not. However, some people do slip through the cracks and end up being related regardless. This is usually due to an illegitimate child being born outside of wedlock, often through a cheating spouse. These children's existences are often covered up by the parents or grandparents, and they'll take that secret to the grave. For those children, there is no way to prove that they are related to the rich family unless a confession is made by one of the family members that created the cover-up. A woman's surname will change to that of their husbands once they are married. However, they can choose to keep their last name instead. Sometimes an agreement can be made between husband and wife where they can both both keep their surnames, just separating them via a hyphen. The surname of children, no matter the case, will always legally be the husband's original last name. They can change it when they become an adult. Depending on how much wealth an Archon has, they will gain a following title, in ascending order. Baron or Baroness, Viscount or Viscountess, Earl or Countess, Marquess or Marchioness, Duke or Duchess. Or they can just use Lord or Lady, depending on their preference, no matter the level of wealth they have, you know as long as they have enough to be a baron or baroness. These titles always come before the first name or, if only their last name is to be used, then it comes before the last name. It's very important to use the full name in reference to the individual when there are multiple people in the vicinity with the same or similar sounding last names. This is to avoid confusion. Unlike other races, the Urshun don't worship a god, nor do they believe in any. Rather than put their faith in a god, the majority have selected to follow a tale of a hero and use it as an example on how to properly act around others. The tale comes in two forms, a children's book by the title The Hero Mordicus and a novel by the title The Tragedy of Mordicus. The Urshun know he isn't real and the story is made up, but since Mordicus's ideals align with Urshun values, the majority of Urshun favor him as a figurehead. The story follows was known as the first dragon slayer, an Archon by the name of Mordicus. He hails from the city of Kai Kraig and sets out on an adventure to free the world of the fear of the most powerful creature at the time, dragons. In order to do this, he travels the world of Nova and gathers companions from the many races, Ursa, Sydney, Kozeli, Zephyr, Pambi Hatari, Yangzi, Meiwei, and Machi. Despite these companions, if anyone were to give the tragedy of Mordicus a proper read, they would realize that he wasn't all that great of a person. He constantly talked down to his companions and sometimes even belittled them over the simplest mistakes that any Archoon can make themselves. He would also cut down any who got in his way, especially a faction of the Tambi Hotari race that worshipped dragons. The well-known dragon slayer also had a bit of a drinking problem. Regardless of his many flaws, there was a lot to admire about him. This included his strong will to fight for what is right, his eyes, and the lines he set for himself with his personal morals that he didn't want to cross. When he wasn't drunk or angry, he was kind and caring. He saved a purse of kitten from a horde of magma slugs and freed people People from enslavement, even temporarily lending a hand to the Seraph to do so. However, if an Archoon were to ask any of the races, or even bring up the tale, regardless of intent, that person may scoff. None of the other races think the tales are any good, and whether or not the Archoon believes them to be true, the races would go out of their way to say the books are just a bunch of hogwash, untrue and unfounded. 
I'd like to give a shout out to my patron, Craft Kraken. Thanks for donating to my Patreon.